What's going on guys, this is Rob. Uh, if you guys enjoy my content, make sure you hit the subscribe button and make sure you hit that little bell so you never miss out on my sexy voice. Okay, so I want to be dangerous in, for the next week, I want to try an experiment for the next week. I've actually been thinking about doing this for a little while, and I've been trying to find a way to see if we can make it work. So what we're going to do for this, for this whole week is we're going to cover the event of fear itself. And this is going to be like a background series of videos in addition to the videos that we normally do. The exception, of course, is today because it's Sunday. And so normally we would cover X, well, we should be covering X-Men and, and Green, uh, Green Lantern, but I've been getting a house remodeled and all kinds of good stuff, and that went on the back burner and I'm going to do this instead. So I'm kind of curious to see how people respond to this. Now, Fear itself is an interesting story. Here's a funny thing about this. So when Marvel, when Joe Quesada took over Marvel uh, Marvel Comics in the, the early 2000s as editor-in-chief, uh, basically from 2000 going forward, it was designed to like rework everything, right? And then we went into Siege, and then we, we had like Dark Reign Siege, the Heroic Age, and then we go into Fear itself. And the Heroic Age was designed to basically say, here's heroes being heroes. Initially, it was like that. Like all these different characters and teams got one shots, and then you had like the actual Heroic Age miniseries and so on and so forth, but it didn't last all that long because in reality, people had kind of liked the darker tone of storytelling, like stories like Civil War, Secret Invasion, things like that. People somewhat enjoyed that. The other half of this was that by the time 2011 and 2012 came around, Marvel was planning out Secret Wars. And so the result was that Jonathan Hickman's fan, I'm sorry, Jonathan Hickman's uh, Avengers, the new Avengers picked up shortly after this and then just started going forward with the collapse of the multiverse. So there wasn't really a whole lot of time to sort of restore heroes back to what they're supposed to be, quote unquote. Instead, it was just kind of picking up, sticking with what worked, and then eventually going into Secret Wars, which led into all new, all different Marvel. Now, initially what this does is this picks up with the character of Sin. Now, Cynthia Smith is the daughter of Red Skull, and her character originally appeared back in Captain America Comics in issue number 290, really 289 going into 290. But she was basically this, this idea that Red Skull wanted an heir for himself. And so with this in mind, what ended up happening here is that Cynthia Schmidt was basically brainwashed, more or less. Now, the original intention of Red Skull was to kill her because she wasn't a boy, but ultimately her life was spared and he started raising her to become his new protege. Now this comes after Ed Brubaker's Captain America run. And the reason why I say that, the reason why it matters is because during that run, that included basically the conclusion of Civil War, uh, the events that went into the death of Captain America, the return of Bucky Barnes, Red Skull having a uh, cosmic cube, different things like that, but ultimately resulted in quote unquote Red Skull dying. And so Cynthia Schmidt, it was really kind of her chance to shine and it was a way to bring her in and have her go forward as a potential replacement for the Red Skull, which of course, as we know, didn't work. That's, that's one of the things you read comics long enough you, one of the things you learn is that nothing ever stays changed forever and so in this instance what she's done is she's allied herself with baron zemo now what they've done is they've discovered the book of the skull and the book of the skull basically housed various secrets that red skull kept hidden and various sources of power that he was never able to use for one reason or another now this ultimately leads into them basically accessing the bunker of you know of red skull and then once they get in cynthia schmidt begins to basically sort of reveal this tale and what we end up finding out is that in in the 19th 40s during uh, during World War II that the Red Skull had essentially traveled to a, a section of Atlanta or really in Germany but had brought Atlantean mystics to him and in turn basically forced them to start using their, their various forms of magics in order to access a sort of super weapon out there that would serve the purpose of allowing the Germans to basically win World War II. Now the other half of this is the invaders themselves because with this going on essentially the artifact that's been summoned more or less by Red Skull has flown across the sky and landed somewhere else meaning they have to go chase it down. Now this ultimately leads to uh, to them basically accessing where the Red Skull was operating out of just because of the fact that word had reached their ears that strange things were going on and the invaders were literally jumping from like basically following the trail of the Germans and liberating all the camps that they could come across. And so when Namor steps in here and ends up finding out that all the members of uh, you know these various uh, Atlanteans have essentially all been killed, it's a big to-do because one of the things to remember is that when it comes to Namor, he is fiercely protective of his people. As Prince, as basically the ruler of Atlantis, he'll go to the ends of the earth. Now, from here, picking up with uh, Red Skull, as well as the rest of these German forces, once they arrive here, you've also got the uh, you got the invaders hot on their trail. Because by this point, the various folks in Germany had basically said, hey, look, here's what was going on with the Red Skull and various magics and so on and so forth. But this item had basically crash land in an, uh, crash landed in Antarctica. And the initial indication is that it's a hammer because Red Skull cannot pick it up. He can't lift it. Now, this is not the hammer of Thor. This is a totally secret hammer that no one's ever known about before. And so the result here is that Red Skull's response is to basically say, no one can know about this 
outside of us. Basically, if you tell anybody, I'll kill you. Not only that, like build a fortress, do whatever you have to do, but your job is to study this thing and learn how to use its power. Now, the big takeaway from this is that one, this is indeed a hammer. Two, uh, Red Skull basically lies to Von Strucker and everybody else when he says, this is explicitly for the fear. None of you guys are supposed to know about this thing. This is not for your eyes to see, when in reality, it was never moved, it was never lifted because it couldn't be lifted by Red Skull or anybody else. And so when Cynthia finishes telling this story to, uh, to, to Baron Zemo, what she ends up doing is basically saying like, this is, you know, what I have here is a map, a location of where this hammer is. Because, you know, accessing this tomb, again, only really reveals information. It doesn't actually reveal any particularly powerful artifacts. And so Cynthia essentially betrays Helmut Zemo and takes off to, to find the hammer for herself. And so at this point, we jump forward to the actual fear itself story. So again, we're gonna do this very similar to Civil War. In the sense that you've got the, the tie-ins and you've got like the main event itself. Now, this is where fear itself really begins to give us what it was that Joe Quesada and company were shooting for. In the sense that like Civil War, it was designed to be a reflection of the, of the modern day. Now, this is in 2010, 2011. And so we're talking about right before the point when like housing prices after the mortgage crisis had reached bare bottom, when it basically like dropped off to the lowest point and then began the, the point of recovery. And so what you have here are a lot of people who are just angry, right? I mean, that's the nature of this. While this story isn't really political, it is designed to basically take these political tones from the real world and feed them into the story, right? Like you had the mortgage crisis in 2008, Americans almost destroyed the economy, Obama told the American people, sorry about your luck, bailed out the banks, and that was the end of that. And so with, with this whole thing going forward, what you have are people who are in a state of anger and resentment and who are lashing out accordingly. But the funny thing about this is that Steve Rogers basically catches on to this small nuanced thing and essentially says people are more aggressive than they normally would be. And so where he's kind of looking at all this, the, the initial response is something's wrong. Things aren't right here. Something's going on here. This also leads to the uh, various armed forces tear gassing uh, protesters because as we know, uh, civil disobedience is still disobedience. And so, of course, they're basically all tear gassed and they're, they're you know, knocked out for a time or at the very least subdued and things kind of return to a state of normalcy. Now, picking back up with, with, with Sin and traveling to Antarct Antarctica, this massive citadel of sorts has basically been constructed. Not only that, what she says is that all these scientists from World War II are currently occupied inside this place, that they've been stuck here the entire time and they have no no idea of what's been going on outside in the real world. They don't know the war has ended. They don't know that Red Skull is basically dead. They don't know any of that stuff. As far as they're aware, they're still operating on orders from the Red Skull. And what they've been doing is studying this hammer the entire time. But in the end, it's all to no avail. They haven't figured out a way to lift it. They haven't figured out a way to tap into its power. It's just a thing that's there. And they're basically doing the same thing day in and day out. And so what ends up happening here is that Sin basically approaches the hammer, picks it up, and immediately switches over. She basically starts calling herself Scotty. Now, the reason why is because that's the actual inscription on the hammer itself. It's basically that hammer's name. And so where she dons this hammer, she begins going forward saying, we're going to seek out its, you know, basically its father, its owner, and then go from there. Now, at this point, this is when we start to switch over into Iron Man, basically rebuilding Asgard. And it's actually a pretty cool thing because remember, this comes after the events of Siege, which come after the events of Dark Reign. So Norman Osborn's already been deposed, right? He's already been toppled, been defeated, and Dark Reign is over. He's no longer in, in control of S.H.I.E.L.D. But for the most part, the, the purpose of Dark Reign and even the events of Siege was to basically disband and to remove the entirety of the Superhuman Registration Act. That was basically a holdover from the events of Civil War. Essentially, it was the Marvel Comics equivalent of somebody just sort of letting their voice trail off. It would just kind of be something that was never really referenced anymore, kind of forgotten, and fans would eventually ask the question, what happened to the Registration Act? And Marvel wouldn't want to have to release a one-shot or go through a whole bunch of hoops in order to provide an answer to that question. And so in this instance, what ends up happening here is, is with the Registration Act gone, Captain America Steve Rogers is, is long since back. He's been reborn after the events of his of his death. And this basically leads into Iron Man chipping up and essentially saying, while this does seem kind of weird, at the end of the day, it is people acting aggressively. That's really all it is because all these tests are being done to ask the question, is it some kind of external factor? Is there some psychic mutant out there that's going crazy and using their powers? Is it some villain? Did Mysterio make it all happen? And there's, there's no answer to that. It's not the actions of any one person that push these people to the extreme. It's just that they're just really that pissed off. And so the response of Iron Man basically looking at Captain America is saying, after World War II was over, what did you guys do? You guys built things. You had the economic explosion of the United States in the 1950s. And so his response is to say, we need to do the same thing. You have people right now who, who basically feel like they were ripped off, left hanging. What they need is to be put to work. What they need is to be able to do something with the auspices that they can make the world better. And so the result is that Iron Man says, we're going to get them to work. Asgard's been destroyed. It was destroyed by the Sentry during Siege. So let's build a new one. I told them I would. So let's just start, you know, let's get to work on building a new Asgard. And that's what everybody starts to do. Now, this is kind of a background thing. Instead, it's basically Iron Man
Superman getting out there and telling the world, here's what we're going to do. We're going to rebuild the entirety of Asgard. Now, the reason why this matters is that for those of you guys who are reading Thor comics right now, what you'll notice is that there's two Asgards. There's basically old Asgard, which also exists in the dimension of Asgard. Then there's Asgardia, which is hovering out there around Saturn somewhere. The one that's around Saturn, that's the one that Iron Man built. And so again, with, with Scotty traveling down to uh, where this particular being is located at, she basically starts facing off against all these various monsters and demons that have been placed there by Odin as kind of a measure of protection. Now, when it comes to Asgardian magic, it gets a little iffy. It's really a plot device more than anything else. Captain America might be able to overcome Asgardian magic in one story, and then he's just hopelessly power, uh, powerless against it in another story. In this instance, these kind of beasts and monsters being placed here, we would have to believe are most likely beings that none of the superheroes would be able to successfully defeat on their own. And so that's why Scaddy's here is because she's going through and literally tearing them limb from limb uh, using this hammer, ripping them apart, only to find out there's basically a kind of sarcophagus with a seal of sorts on it. And when she penetrates this seal and enters into the inside, into this sort of, you know, tomb, more or less, she's met by the arrival of a guy who refers to himself as the Allfather, saying that, like, he's the rightful ruler of Asgard. So it's a pretty cool thing, because when that happens, Odin basically says, this is it. This is the prophecy that I've been trying to avoid for all this time. The serpent has finally made his return. And so it's interesting here, because when Thor comes along and, and basically starts conversing with his father, the two of them start getting really, really aggressive, because Thor's idea is, look, we should be standing next to the earthly superheroes who are looking to try to find a way to rebuild Asgard. For Odin, it's really more pride than anything else, and that's always been the thing about his character. The way that Odin's been written in Marvel Comics has always been that he's exceedingly prideful, in the sense that he's like, Asgardian business is Asgardian business, and we do not air our dirty laundry. But for Thor, he's walking the middle of the road. He's an Avenger on one side and an Asgardian on the other. And when the, when the question was asked earlier, which one would he choose, Asgardians or man, he chooses man. And so the result here is that he's kind of taken a stance against Odin. Now, where Thor pops up with Mjolnir and is just kind of like, look, if that's how you want to be, then we can take this to the mattresses and, and I can beat, beat the hell out of you with the hammer. It's basically Odin responding by saying, hammer drop, do not allow Thor to lift you. Now, it's small things like this that really go towards the idea of Thor becoming unworthy. When Thor first lost the ability to wield his hammer, not only could Thor not lift it, Odin couldn't lift it. The hammer had basically had a will of its own. It was doing its own thing. Now, of course, we know the answer to that now, but at the time, it, you know, at the time we didn't. And that was the nature of the hammer in response to how the Asgardian mythos functioned, that while it was the hammer that Thor wielded, it was, it was basically passed on to him by Odin. And the enchantment that Odin placed on it was that only a worthy person could wield it. And so the response that Odin makes is that he gives and he takes away. And so basically it's, it's one of these things, by the grace of me goes your ability to wield that hammer. And it's a, it's a significant moment because it shows just how much more powerful Odin is than Thor. Regardless, what ends up happening is Odin basically says, we're departing this place. We don't need humanity's aid. We're leaving this place and we're going back to Asgard. And so again, it's interesting because switching back over to uh, to, to Skadi and with this, this guy, basically the serpent, her response is, if what you're looking to do is topple the Asgardians and essentially conquer the world, is this something that can be done by us? And the, the response he gives is, it will not just be us. It's going to be those who I deem to be worthy. And so what he does is he basically summons a handful of hammers, which are going to land in different places on earth and various people are going to pick them up and they're going to become the worthy, basically the followers of, uh, of, of the serpent and in turn, like be imbued with all new levels of powers, each one representing a different facet of what the serpent stands for. And so while all this is going on, essentially earth is, is under siege by hidden Asgardian powers that no one really seemed to be aware of before outside of Odin. And in the moment when they could use the help of the Asgardians, they leave. Odin instructs all of them to walk away. And so they're all basically being taken back to Asgard. Thor himself is being forced back there and Earth is being left to the defense of the superheroes who were there. And that's really about it. So we are continuing on with Fear Itself, and uh, yeah, Fear, it is a really cool story. It is a pretty badass story. At this point, we pick up with Journey Into Mystery. Now, for those of you guys who don't know, Journey Into Mystery, originally it was like a sci-fi a sci story. It was, it was a series of like, you know, science fiction, mystery comics, whatever, and then Thor appeared. And then Thor was so popular that eventually Journey Into Mystery became the Thor line of comics. For the most part, when Journey Into Mystery was brought back, it basically revolved around Loki. And the reason for that, again, came out of Siege. And this is part of the things that we've talked about in the past, 
where we've said that Marvel does soft reboots, which is to say they shuffle up a character, they change status quo, but they don't do hard line reboots, despite the fact that they need to. Uh, in this instance, what ended up happening is that during the events of Siege on Asgard, in Thor issue number 617, which was actually part of the aftermath to Siege, we ended up discovering that what Loki had done is he had gone to Hela, who was basically the ruler of the Asgardian afterlife, and it essentially like bartered things so that he could basically return to life when his physical form died. And so what ended up happening after this was that in Thor 617, Loki came back, but he was a little kid and he had no knowledge of anything he had done when he was an adult. He was basically a blank slate. So again, it was pretty smart and it was a pretty genius idea in terms of trying to rework his character. Kid Loki is actually pretty cool. Namely, Loki has discovered the internet and it is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> he's basically taking pi taking pictures of all these crazy things happening around like Asgard and people are just like that's not like like you had to have used the lens filter because obviously he's using Instagram but anyway one of the other things to notice here is that Loki's basically being ridiculed by one of the other Asgardians and this was par for the course people remember him as the trickster the bad guy the one that's essentially brought nothing but ruin and pain upon Asgard itself but for Thor one thing to remember is Loki is his brother and Thor really sees this version of kid Loki for what he is he's not really blinded by the things Loki's done in the past and so the result is that he kind of chases a few of these bullies off and basically says hey look this is kind of how these things go eventually it'll pass and so it's kind of interesting here because loki's saying stuff like like when he discovered the internet he's saying stuff like i told people i was an asgardian and they started calling me a troll like nobody on the internet believes me and 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 to me it's it's such an awesome exchange right you know because thor's kind of like well i mean you know loki is i am aware of the internet and we avoid it avidly because people on the internet are weird like i, <laughs> I mean not really but it's just kind of a fun funny thing you know like I like the idea of kid Loki discovering the internet but the fact remains here that what Loki ends up doing is stumbling upon this this magpie this bird and as soon as he approaches it the thing explodes and reveals a key and this is why journey into mystery is so cool is because when you look at traditional Thor stories which is to say basically everything after journey into mystery and especially going from really the the bronze age from like the mid 1970s up to the modern day Thor stories are pretty straightforward it's just like Thor's fighting a bad guy and smashing things with his hammer because that's what he does and that's what you want to see but with journey into mystery the way this is done is a throwback to the old journey into mystery stories where it was as much about like the history and mythos of asgard and telling stories in an asgardian fashion as it was about events unfolding in a way that was interesting and so in this journey that loki goes on he discovers this key takes it to what's basically kind of a, a an elf of sorts who starts singing off this poem loki, loki listens to it realizes part of the poem is a location he travels there awakens a demon which immediately explodes feeds the demon to volstag and then listens to what volstag Volstag says, which is kind of a rhyme or really kind of a, a few words of sorts, follows the, the advice that's given to him in the sense that it's like the, the third passage or so on and so forth, discovers a dragon, which basically explodes in front of him, kind of disintegrates, and then like speak, or at least it speaks to him in the old tongue first, then it disintegrates, and then he starts basically following these, these sage bits. He reads this little passage that says that Loki went into the void, and no one knows why, and that's when he falls down into this darker place and discovers the older version of himself. This is classic journey into mystery Thor storytelling. So meeting with his older self, uh, this older version of Loki basically says, look, like I am here to impart wisdom on you and I'm the reason why you exist. Basically, I had bartered with Hela, everything that we said at the beginning of the video. Uh, and the idea was that I would be reborn in a new physical form. Now, this is important because this is not really the spirit of older Loki. It's more of like a memory echo. But this is kind of an important thing because over the course of the journey into mystery line, which we may or may not cover, there will be points when kid Loki will meet with his older self. And there's actually points in, in the modern uh, Thor storytelling where Loki, where kid Loki will not only meet with his older self, he'll actually meet with a female version of himself and then the modern day Loki will meet with kid Loki and the female version and his original self so there's it's really one of these things where because of the steps that Loki's taken to ensure his own existence very akin to like Voldemort and the Horcruxes what this means is that there are sort of echoes of himself that exist out there in the Marvel landscape which can be encountered by any one of his versions at any particular point in time assuming that echo's already been created but it's basically him saying look like I have sage advice to give you I have bits of knowledge to give you you have to listen to this because there is a crisis coming to earth and to asgard of course we know that older loki is speaking of uh speaking of the serpent and these are important things to remember because by and large loki was always considered to be the trickster and the guy who created mischief and that's true but because of his experiences in traveling around the various cosmos because of his experience in seeing and doing all these things what this means is that loki has a vast amount of knowledge some of which is based on things he's not supposed to know and so because of all this he's a very very huge resource if you can find a way to tap into that without incurring his wrath or or, or, you know, letting him trick you 
you or something along those lines. And that's what happens with Kid Loki. And it's kind of a cool thing because this is really Marvel saying like Loki is Loki is Loki is Loki. It'll always end up being the same. All of this has happened before and all of it will happen again to quote Battlestar Galactica. That all roads lead to Rome. That no matter how many times Loki's reborn, no matter how many, no matter how many times he returns to his former self, he will always end up becoming the Loki that we always know because that's what his character is. That's what he's about. And so what this story does is it basically segues into the, the tail bit of Asgard, I'm sorry, of uh, Fear Itself that we covered in the last video where Odin essentially like leads the Asgardians out of uh, out of Earth and takes them directly to, uh, takes directly back to Asgard, to the Asgardian dimension uh, where they can essentially go through and start recreating everything. Now, at this point, we kind of switch over to the aftermath, right? Like to when they're actually in Asgard itself. And you remember like this, this place is just in shambles. I mean, it's been this way ever since Ragnarok. It's been just torn to pieces. Now, again, it's entirely within the power of Odin to fix it all. And that's really what he says. But notice this, not everyone agrees with what Odin does. And that's one of the misconceptions a lot of people I think have when it comes to the Thor mythos is a lot of people look at the character of Odin and they say, well, he's the all father. He's the leader. Of course, they all follow him. Loki and Thor are the only ones that really kind of do what they want. Not true. Just because Odin is the all father and the leader does not mean everyone agrees with what he does. The difference here is that Odin has enough power to obliterate anybody and he pretty much will. And so because of this, Thor basically speaks up when a couple people start talking about how it feels like a retreat. Thor says that's because it is because the power that's there on Earth, whatever this serpent is, is enough that it scares Odin and Odin is essentially running away. And so where Thor questions his father's authority, where he calls him in and, and says, look, you're essentially a coward is what you are. Like you're a weakling. Our job is to protect all nine of the realms. You are hiding in your in your home, waiting for the threat to come to you. You are every ounce the coward that, that you're acting as. Then Odin immediately has him locked up, immediately has Thor like taken away and put in chains. And so at this point, this is when we start getting into the idea of the worthy. Those individuals out there who are given these secret Asgardian hammers. And the first one up is Juggernaut. So, <laughs> uh, but what ends up happening is of course you have Juggernaut going through his workout time. Seven minutes is really all he gets. And then he, and then like while all this is going on, a hammer crash lands into uh, into the prison. And of course, this is one of the things that you, that you end up finding out. Those individuals who are worthy, the hammer will speak to them. They'll just hear words, voices, things like that emanating from the hammer itself. And so when Juggernaut picks it up, he basically ends up becoming Kurth, the breaker of stone. Now again, this idea of Juggernaut gaining another power source in addition to what he has will be a major plot point when it comes to this story. So this is something that I want you to keep in the back of your head as we go further through the Fear Itself event. But Juggernaut with this power is, is immense. I mean, he just starts smashing everything in his path. And so what ends up happening is we switch over directly to uh, Steve Rogers, to Captain America, uh, to Maria Hill, to Sharon Carter. And it's basically like the new Avengers roster combined with what passes for what's left of the Thunderbolts. And it's essentially this idea that like all this pandemonium and chaos is happening around the world, that these objects are crash landing. Now, in response to them landing, various places around the world, major metropolitan areas are turning into absolute madhouses. Things are completely and totally going awry. And so Reed Richards chimes in as part of the Future Foundation. Remember, this comes after Hickman's Fantastic Four. So the Future Foundation's already been formed by that point. But Reed chimes in as a Future Foundation and says, look, a hammer or something like that has crash landed in New York. We're studying it at the moment, but it looks like it's as, uh, you know, it's from, uh, it's of Asgardian nature. So this thing looks pretty intense. And then we switch over to the one thing everybody wants to see, the Incredible Hulk. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the coolest things. This is what I love about you guys. Everybody loves the Incredible Hulk. What people love even more is when the Incredible Hulk gets something that modifies his power. What they love more than that is when he gets somebody else's power source. <laughs> Specifically when he gets an Asgardian hammer. People love that kind of stuff. But this basically takes place after the events of Greg Pak's run. And really kind of the finality of that event, you know, from, from Heart of the Monster Hulk. And we saw from that story that it picked up where it really ended with like the Incredible Hulk, Bruce Banner, and Betty Ross, Red She-Hulk, just kind of jumping out and doing doing what they do in the heat of passion. And so they're just kind of there doing their thing. But while all this is going on, a hammer basically lands. And the Incredible Hulk sort of listens to it, hears it talking, and then against Betty Ross' protest, goes to pick it up. And when he does, he turns into like the most badass looking character. Now, it is not an accident for why he looks this way. While this is a totally new design for him, it does have some hints and homages to the time when he basically became a horseman for Apocalypse, when he became War, I think it was. But again, I mean, he's Null, and he's basically called the Breaker of Worlds, uh, because what in the hell else would you call him? Everybody loves World Breaker Hulk. But again, it's, it's, it's kind of cool, because from here, we basically pick up with a character named Titania. Now, the character of Titania made her debut back in Secret Wars, issue number three, the original Secret Wars from 1984. The original Secret Wars was a highly publicized story. So because of that, the idea was that if 
so many people are going to be reading this story, then not only was the basis of it to bring like all the heroes and villains together and have them face off against each other in an effort to sell toys, uh, but why not add some new characters in there? And so what we got, we got a couple different people there. We got uh, Jennifer Carpenter, who was the original Spider Woman, uh, but then we also got Titania, Mary McFerrin. Now Mary McFerrin was not really interesting up until that point. In fact, her origin story was pretty mundane. She was raised in the suburbs of Denver. She was shy. She was timid and never really had anything going for. The idea was that during the events of Secret Wars, before Doctor Doom had stolen the power of Galactus and then eventually the power of the Beyonder, what he had done was he had basically created kind of like a supervillain team trying to recruit people to his side. And so what ended up happening here is that Doom discovered uh, Mary and another character, and I can't remember her name, like Vanessa, I think it was, and then in turn basically endowed them with powers. Now, Mary was endowed with basically super strength, durability, different things like that, and she was also like grown in size. So she became a lot more voluptuous and uh, she became a lot like a lot stronger, a lot more muscular than her previous version had been. Now, after the events of Secret Wars, she kind of had an on again, off again relationship with Crusher Creel, which basically became more solidified by the mid 1990s. And so by that point going forward, they were just kind of together. Uh, but from there, like what ends up happening, she's one of the people who basically seizes a hammer for herself. It crashes, she grabs it, picks it up. And then she tells Absorbing Man, you have a hammer waiting on you. And this is kind of a big deal because Crusher Creel is someone who can basically absorb various metals and turn himself into those metals, absorb their properties. And so in turn, giving him a hammer, I would argue he, he could potentially be one of the most powerful. Now we'll find out as time goes on, but it's, kind of, it's somewhat of a cool thing because in this moment with all of the all the worthy basically being selected or a huge number of them being selected essentially the serpent starts reaching out to all of them and saying your job now is to basically fill the world with chaos to seed as much chaos destruction and fear as you possibly can and when that's done we'll take the next step and that's exactly what they do they start ripping through and tearing things up now this fear spreads more fear i mean the incredible hulk running through ripping things to pieces red she hulk doing what she can it's instilling as much fear as possible because now you have all these people with this these insane levels of strength and power who are just running rampant across the face of the earth and where the avengers try to respond the problem with this is that their communications network is essentially taken down when the white house and the capital are totally obliterated and so where captain america kind of sends out the sos and says avengers assemble there's no one there to respond no one answers him and so essentially everyone's kind of scattered to the four winds it's pandemonium it's, it's a worst case situation it's pretty messed up and it's pretty rough but it's amazing Okay, so we are continuing on with fear itself. And uh, here was the deal with fear itself. I, I kind of want to talk about this for a second because there's a couple things that I feel like we need to explain looking at the comments of the previous videos with some of the questions you guys had. First and foremost, fear itself was one of these stories that was designed to rework things. Marvel still had a lot of things that had been held over from the Joe Quesada era of, of or at least his whole idea of pushing things and, and making a new direction. So essentially everything from like Avengers Disassembled running all the way up to to, uh, really the heroic age, running all the way up to Dark Reign. So over the span of about seven years or so, uh, there were a lot of things that had happened, a lot of a lot of status quo changes. The Avengers were disbanded. They were replaced by the new Avengers. 98% of the mutant population lost their powers. There were a lot of things that went on in Marvel at the time. One of the most notable things was the death of Captain America. And we'll talk more about that here in a second. But what this story was designed to do in a lot of ways was to take a lot of those uh, threads that had kind of been left hanging, those plot threads that had just sort of been dangling all this time and essentially wrap them up to, to basically tie up loose ends. Now, not all of them were tied up. And in fact, the ones that weren't tied up were designed or were left that way for the purpose of telling future stories later on down the line. For example, you know, the formation of Stark Resilient, which would come later on, different things like that. But the idea here is that we initially pick up with, with Captain America facing off against, you know, the forces of, uh, of, of Sin and really what kind of passes for Hydra, but not really. But again, this is not like Steve Rogers' Captain America. This is Bucky Barnes' Captain America. Now, the reason why I feel like that needs to be explained is because one, I don't think I explained that in the first or second video. And two, this, this event fear itself actually wraps that up. So when Captain America died after the events of Civil War and following that, Iron Man, I'm pretty sure it's Iron Man, takes Captain America's uniform and gives it to Bucky Barnes. And so Bucky Barnes becomes the new Captain America. And his arrival was met with a kind of a, it was a mixed reaction. Some of the, the old guard who really, really, really wanted Steve Rogers to stay. And there were some who were the old guard that wanted Steve Rogers to go. And then of course there were new fans who wanted to see Steve Rogers stay and there were old fans who, or I guess new fans who wanted to see him go. It was really kind of a mixed bag of people who wanted to see different things. But in, in any event, Steve Rogers had come back about a year before this story took place. He came back 2009, 2010, somewhere, on, uh, somewhere along those lines. And it was, of course, the Captain America Reborn storyline where you found out he was time displaced. They basically pulled a Batman from Final Crisis. But then once he made his return, there was a one-shot follow-up. And it was basically the question of who's going to wear the shield? Who's going to have Captain America's shield? Is it going to be Bucky or is it going to be Steve Rogers? And what this did is it allowed 
Marvel to spin Steve Rogers out into a whole other series called Secret Avengers. And Secret Avengers basically served the purpose of having like a Black Ops team for the Avengers group. But that's, that's the team that Steve Rogers largely led. Uh, and, and that was his whole thing. What this does is it basically removes Bucky Barnes from the mantle and it brings Steve Rogers back. But at the moment right now with this initial charge going into uh, going into the US Capitol, it really is Bucky Barnes leading the team. Now, switching over to Asgard, this was, well, this was this was an interesting, uh, interesting situation because this again deals with Kid Loki. And that's one of the things that goes on here. When it comes to the event of, of uh, Fear itself, it was a little bit different from a lot of the other crossover events that you saw in the sense that Journey into Mystery was designed to provide the back end for why it was Loki was doing what he was doing in the main story itself. Whereas in a lot of the events that go on, sometimes, especially like when it came to like Secret Empire, for example, the tie-ins are wholly separated from the main story itself. And so you'll have like the beginning of the of the event, you know, of, of like Secret Empire, for example, and then it'll split off into tie-ins. And the tie-ins will show what characters are doing, and then they'll, they'll wrap back into the main event at the end. And so unless you've been reading the tie-ins, you have no idea how that character got to where they were. With this, it's totally different. Fear itself was designed to be kind of like a new age of storytelling when it comes to crossover events. It was basically this idea of like the main story gives you all you need and you don't really need anything else. But you go read Civil War and it's it's woefully incomplete if you don't read the main or if you don't read the tie-ins. Nothing really seems to make sense. And, and and so it's 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 one of those interesting scenarios. But nonetheless, Kid Loki showing up here is basically for the purposes of breaking Thor out of prison. What Kid Loki's been doing so far has basically been trying to sow revolution within the Asgardian uh, landscape. The problem with this is that under under most normal circumstances, people may have been inclined to side with him if it wasn't him, if it wasn't Loki. If it was Thor, people would follow him. They would. It would basically be Thor leading a revolt against Odin, which isn't really something Thor would do, but with Kid Loki, he definitely would. The problem with this is that, again, Kid Loki's got the reputation of Loki, and so everybody would look at what he's saying and essentially coming along and being like, look, Odin's kind of lost his mind. We've got to find a way to stand out to him. We have to go back to Earth, and we have to protect it. They would look at it as some kind of ruse, and so nobody really trusted Loki, and so at this moment, it's just kind of coming along and saying, okay, look, we've got to free Thor. Like we got to get Thor out of here and get Thor back to Earth. And so in the interim, what this does is it picks up with uh, really this kind of calamity across the board in the sense that Absorbing Man basically has the powers of Thor. The Incredible Hulk now has the powers of Thor. I mean, it's it's all these crazy situations. And in response to the Incredible Hulk, what this ends up doing is bringing in like Carol Danvers, Spider-Woman, Jessica Drew, which I don't even know why she's there. Here's a funny thing. So Jessica Drew has the ability to emit pheromones that will not really have this the exact same effect as Purple Man. She can't really dominate the wills of others but she can make them fall in love with her. Now she tried it on Wolverine. In fact, myself and Sal at Comic Pop were having this cool conversation. I called him up, but we ended up getting, like he ended up talking about Jessica Drew, about Spider-Woman. And he was like, well, Spider-Woman tried her pheromones on Wolverine and all it did was make him dizzy. So people with healing factors can combat it, but they're not like totally immune to it. With the Incredible Hulk, it would have to be the same way. But keep in mind, this Thor Hulk, for lack of a better word, is basically like mindless savage Hulk, but bent for a particular purpose. But all these people who are picking, who are wielding these hammers are all driven by fear. That's the important thing to bear in mind here. And the reason why is that when we switch over to the Fantastic Four, with the hammer having landed on Yancey Street in New York, the Fantastic Four were one of the first people to respond and to investigate. Now remember, while all this is going on, the world is going to pot. Like everybody else is dealing with a zillion different things. But when the Fantastic Four chime into the Avengers and say, hey, look, we're investigating things, then that means you leave the Fantastic Four to their devices. And so with Ben Grimm showing up, the hammer starts talking to him. He starts hearing voices emanating from it. And when he goes to pick it up, of course, he's transformed into a mindless beast itself and just starts ripping everything to pieces. So again, every single person that gets one of these hammers is driven by fear and serves the purpose of sowing chaos. That's basically what this is. And the reason why is because the serpent feeds on fear. So, so long as those around him are feeling fear, he'll continue to grow stronger and, and you know, basically gain more and more power. Now for Thor himself, where he's freed by Loki and basically meets with Sif and the Warriors 3, the idea of basically standing against Odin, of leaving Odin's, Odin's eye traveling to Midgard, it amounts to heresy. This is a very dangerous, dangerous game they're playing because while Odin wouldn't necessarily kill them, Odin would certainly like he could banish them from Asgard. He could make them mortal, like send them away. The Odin forces is capable of doing all manner of different things. Again, it's a very dangerous game that they're playing here. And this game is discovered when Odin shows up. Now, this is kind of a funny thing here. This is really sort of feeding on the old nature of the Thor comics, the historical, you know, publication history of Thor comics, as opposed to what we would expect. With Odin having previously locked up Thor and Loki breaking him out, and then coming into the situation where Thor has basically been freed and he's talking of revolt against Odin, it's not really like Thor is talking of revolt in the sense of leading the armies of Asgard against Odin himself. It's basically Odin walking in to his son and his friends, talking about abandoning Odin's view and traveling back to Midgard. And at this point, it's one of those things where it's like a father and a son. Sons always get a lot more 
leeway with fathers. It's, it's just the way it is because it's their offspring. You know, parents are a lot more lenient with kids. And so instead of like casting Thor to prison, instead of making him mortal or something like that, he says, fine, then you will, you'll have your quest. If what you want to do is go to earth and fight among the people who are, who are there, then do that. Now, a lot of this stems from the fact that Odin knows how stubborn Thor is. If Thor says, this is what I want to do, I want to go to earth and I want to fight alongside the earthlings because I feel more kin to them than I do to you, uh, then Odin's going to be like, fine, because there's no talking Thor out of it. And so ultimately Odin casts him out, sends him back to earth, gives him his hammer and says, here, you'll need this, but you've got a time frame. Once the serpent's power rises, like once he gets to the point where he's all powerful, where he seizes control of earth, then one of two things is going to happen. Either I'm going to bring you back or I'm going to let you die. But regardless of what fate it is, you've brought it on yourself. And so again, it's kind of a cool thing because switching back to Captain America and the Capitol with him. Falcon Black Widow facing off against Sin with all this new power. It's interesting because one of the things to bear in mind is that when it comes to Marvel, when it comes to stories like this, oftentimes they kind of seem to stretch the limits of credulity and they don't really seem to make sense. And the reason why is because you're dealing with someone with a formidable amount of power, both in strength, speed, durability, as well as the, the power she wields by virtue of her hammer and would easily be able to crush Black Widow, Falcon, and Captain America. And so the question you would probably ask is, why are these the ones fighting? Well, in reality, the Avengers were never really, they never really consisted of the most powerful beings in Marvel, in Marvel comics. That was really reserved more for the X-Men. The Avengers were mostly just like the bravest people. You know, they'll run headlong into their own deaths, but they'll run headlong. No, aside from the Incredible Hulk, Thor, the Avengers usually consist of mid-range to some of the weakest characters in the Marvel Universe. I mean, it's Captain America. What the hell can Captain America do? He can punch really hard and run fast and throw a shield. He's not ultra strong. He can't, you know, control the elements. I mean, he can't do any of that cool stuff. The X-Men can, which some people will say the X-Men are kind of broken, which they are. Sidetrack, think about that for a second. All right, so among the mutant population, you've got Franklin Richards kind of, depending on who's writing the story. Sometimes he's a result of the cosmic control rod, which is basically Galactus's power, the, the power cosmic from the negative zone, uh, or he's a mutant. All right, you've got Storm, who's pretty much Omega level. Why the hell haven't they confirmed it? You've got Magneto, you've got Emma Frost, you've got Matthew Malloy, I mean, you have like all these super powerful Omega level characters who are just broken as hell. Like, dude, the X-Men are so broken. Somebody make an argument in the comment section. Somebody create an argument and, and tell me why the X-Men are not OP and broken. If, if you can make a convincing argument, I will give you a Rob Core ring. So moving on <laughs> from our little rant, our little diatribe. Uh, of course, Sin takes it to Captain America. And that's the important thing to remember. Captain America is kind of like the leader of the group, right? Like he's like the moral support. If you take him down, then every most everybody else will lose their moral backbone. She ends up ripping off the arm of, of Bucky Barnes, plunges a staff right through his chest, and it essentially seems to kill him. And that's really the end of him. Like, that's the end of Bucky Barnes. You know, at this point, he's just kind of like, look, you have to tell everyone the serpent is 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 literally the person behind this, because at the moment, they haven't known. The, the Avengers haven't really known who's behind this. All they've known is that these artifacts, which they learned were hammers, had crash landed on Earth, different people had picked them up, they gained insane levels of power, and they'd just been attacking cities. By having contact with the hammer itself, he's learned the hammer's secrets. And the hammer's secrets are that it's basically the serpent who's behind all this, who's waging a war against Earth and eventually seeks to set his sights on Asgard and retake the throne. Okay, so continuing on with fear itself, uh, at this point, we pick up with, well, basically with the re the arrival of Thor, with Thor showing back up. Now, here's a funny thing. Thor showing up here after being kind of banished, but not really from Asgard. Uh, once he shows up here, he immediately arrives in Broxton, Oklahoma. Now, again, for those of you guys who are not really familiar with Thor comics, Broxton is basically where he rebuilt Asgard. The problem with this was that the War of, of Dark Reign essentially came on the doorsteps of Broxton to Asgard proper and left the city in complete and total disarray. So no one here is too happy to see Thor. You know, everybody's not too happy to see him. They're kind of like, man, get out of here. Like, we really don't want to see you or your problems go away. It's kind of like my ex-girlfriend, you know, just get out of here. Uh, I'd rather not see you like for the rest of my life. And so because of this, uh, Thor ends up just sort of making his way back to the, you know, to where the rest of the superheroes reside. But what this does is this transitions over to the serpent himself, sort of talking about what's going on. Now, it's not a great big, huge, long explanation. But one thing that, I, that we're going to kind of do here is we're going to cheat a little bit. We're going to sort of cover this and then the next part and then we're gonna like we're basically gonna skip over the uncanny x-men and then come back to it in the next video that we make so we're gonna cheat a little bit uh you know we're basically gonna kind of you know skip over the part of unstoppable juggernaut i kind of think don't think we should but we're going to and uh, in the next video we'll, we'll we'll cover that bit but in any event with everything unfolding the way it is the serpent really just kind of gives us a synopsis of what he's done so far which is to say what it is that he's shooting for and all he's doing is powering himself by fear and that's the whole basis that's one of the things about normal humans in marvel comics in marvel comics when it comes to average everyday people it's usually that they're like the most annoying part of the story because by and large they just get really scared and run away but that's really the big the big thing that happens every one 
once in a while, like a person might step up. But by and large, they just kind of run and hide and let the superheroes do all the heavy lifting. And so in response to this, with humans being so, so really so timid in relation to like the greater universe out there, when a being of significant power shows up, they react with fear and that feeds the serpent. At the same time, Odin is basically not really rebuilding Asgard, but essentially having the the, the wheels of war pre you know, prepared, having the Asgardians get to work on building more weapons, different things like that. Now, in reality, one of the things that people would ask is why aren't the dwarves doing this? And in truth, is probably just to kind of push the story. The dwarves were really some of the some of the greatest you know weapons masters in the entirety of the Marvel universe. I mean, that includes like every everybody. The dwarves make some of the best weapons, and so where Odin is going through and creating weapons similar to that, this is an Asgardian war, so it makes sense that Asgardians would be the one to build these things. And so that's really what's kind of going on. Now at this point, we transition to the aftermath of the death of Bucky, and it's kind of a cool thing because we end up meeting up really with classic Nick Fury. Now, of course, classic Nick Fury is always alive because he's classic Nick Fury. Why wouldn't he be? But well, the question sort of asked, what is this this happening here? And and what's this serpent being that you know Bucky had, had basically talked about? Thor arrives and chimes in and simply says the serpent is a being that really only Odin knows about and is known about for quite some time. Now, something I want you to notice here is that Thor just kind of takes it with a grain of salt. He just sort of throws it out there because by this point, it's to be expected, especially when you're Thor and you're dealing with things like this. It's par for the course. Odin doesn't tell the Asgardians everything. And it kind of makes sense because the Asgardians are like children for, for Odin. You know, you don't tell your child everything because your child doesn't need to know everything. And so it's much the same way when it comes to Thor and, and Odin and the rest of the Asgardians. Odin houses a lot of secrets and those secrets are really just his to keep and to let them out if time permits or if he wants to. And so with a situation like this, Thor knows enough to know the serpent is a very, very old enemy of Asgard, but that's really about it. But the bigger thing he hits on here is that the serpent is fighting with the full might of what's basically Asgardian power behind him. The longer he stays here, the more people are terrified, the more powerful he will become until eventually he returns to 100% full strength. And when that happens, it's going to be difficult for anybody to win. And so when, what we end up doing is basically picking up with Steve Rogers. He's kind of been kept in, in the background the whole time. And he's brought back out, basically redons the Captain America uniform and his business as usual. Now with him, it's, it's kind of chiming in and saying, look, okay, where do we stand with everything? And he's given the whole rundown of everything that's happened so far. But Steve Rogers response is, okay, well, we have to act. We have to do something. If we do nothing, the serpent will continue to get stronger. The serpent's power developing and, and expanding is not a result of the action of the Avengers or the superhero community. It's a result of fear. So if they do nothing, they'll basically be sitting on the sidelines while the serpent gets more and more powerful. Because of this, uh, with the serpent drawing his energy and feeding on it more and more, ultimately he finally reaches his quote unquote final form, if we had to give it that, that depiction. And it's basically a very young guy. And so it's kind of cool here because this, this dude is wielding an insane amount of power. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy how much power he has. To give you perspective, when Captain America alongside the mighty Avengers and the the you know what's left of the regular Avengers when they all show up here they're basically doing their best to fend off as best they can but they don't really stand much of a chance now for a second I want to sidetrack and I want to pick up with with Iron Man now Iron Man being here is actually kind of funny because he shows up to like the old ruins of Asgard what used to be Asgard and Brox uh, Broxton Oklahoma and summons Odin now that's one of the important things to bear in mind here in Marvel Comics it's entirely possible for anybody on Earth to contact Odin whether Odin will respond or not is totally up to him. That's one of the things to bear in mind. The idea of the of, of Earth, you know, of, of Earth kind of being divvied up among these various deities, more or less, these godly beings, is somewhat of a misnomer. All the various godly beings that exist in real world religion exist inside the Marvel Universe, and you can talk to any of them. I mean, you can, you can try to contact any of them. You can contact Zeus, you can contact Odin. If they want to listen to you, if they're willing to give you, you know, any measure of attention, if they'll give you an audience, they'll listen to you. If not, then they won't. And so in this instance, Iron Man shows up and just screams out the name of Odin. And basically what happens happens is he gets drunk and then starts yelling at Odin. That's basically what happens here. You know, it's it's kind of interesting because in order to get the attention of Odin, it's not really a sacrifice. It's only you have to go to an altar, sacrifice a goat, and then, you know, dance around nine times, say a prayer, and then Odin will respond. It's one of these things where it's like, if you're worth listening to, then Odin will listen to you. And where where Iron Man starts talking to uh, starts talking to Odin, it's kind of interesting because his response is, I didn't actually expect you to answer. But the funny response that Odin gives Iron Man is basically saying, but like you're a friend of Thor, like like you are one of Thor's teammates as part of the Avengers. It's the only reason why I'm talking to you right now. And so it's, it's interesting because with Tony Stark basically being drunk and just yelling at Odin, uh, one of the like what he starts to talk about is the idea of how Odin is leaving the entirety of Earth superheroes to fend for themselves. And Odin interprets this as, as Iron Man saying, I want you to give us your armies. Like I want you to give us as guardians to fight on our behalf or to fight alongside us so we can protect the Earth. But Odin's interpretation 
interpretation is entirely wrong. And Iron Man picks up on this when Odin's just kind of like, look, this is, I mean, sure, this is our fight, but like we're mustering our forces here. We'll fight the serpent once basically all you guys are dead and there's nothing left. And then we're going to obliterate the entirety of the planet Earth. But Iron Man's response is, no, that's not what I want. I don't want you to fight on our behalf. I don't want you to, to, to you know, fight in our stead. We don't want your Asgardians to pick up the slack for us or anything like that. What I do for a living is I make weapons. Like I am exceedingly good at making weapons. I don't want access to your soldiers. I want access to your workshop. I want to blend Asgardian, you know, technology with Stark tech. That's what I want to do. I want to create a whole new slew of weapons designed to use your power with my power and destroy the serpent. And so it's actually pretty cool. And it's, and it's really awesome because it's basically Iron Man developing, you know, Asgardian slash Stark technology uh, using, you know, his own ingenuity and, and so on and so forth. And it's entirely possible. I mean, it's one of those things where it's not like this is unfamiliar territory to Iron Man. It is to a degree, but he He's been a friend of Thor for so long that he's well versed in, in essentially just like navigating the waters of using Asgardian energy or the very use uh, at the very least understanding how it works. I mean, he's made anti, you know, he's made like Thor Buster suits in the past. So it's not entirely, you know, something that he's entirely unaware of. But at this point, we end up having Thor who had basically faced off against the serpent and he was able, I mean, wasn't really able to hold his own, but he was enough of a challenge that the serpent saw him as somebody that could potentially get in the way. And so what he ends up doing is having Thor face off against uh, Ben Grimm and the, and the Incredible Hulk. Now, Thor fighting against Ben Grimm is pretty quick and to the point. I mean, he's defeated pretty fast and, and it's kind of interesting thor literally throws his hammer and summons it back and summons it back to himself and it punches a hole through ben Grimm, much like you guys probably saw in the story of infinity when thor destroyed a builder but then he turns his attention to the incredible hulk and this fight is hard core i mean it is an absolute brutal brutal intense fight i mean it's 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 balls to the wall and it's cool to see because with these two guys you know tearing through each other it's it's literally blow for blow punch for punch hit for hit but one of the things that thor says and this is a very very big thing one of the things that thor says is i can't beat you like i know for a fact i've never been able to beat you and the incredible hulk's response is i always knew that like i always knew that was the case and that makes sense i mean the incredible hulk's strength is limitless thor's strength is not so just by logic and reason we know that thor would not have been able to to defeat the incredible hulk i mean in my mind i think it really comes down to the Superman versus Incredible Hulk style fight, right? Like that's one of the big debates. Can Superman beat the Incredible Hulk? Yes, unless the fight goes on long enough and then the Incredible Hulk will just be too strong for Superman and then Superman will be defeated. But like at the outset, maybe he can, maybe he can't. I don't know, it's probably a wash. I don't really care enough to argue the point. But with Thor, it's much the same way. You know, if Thor nips it in the bud right off the bat, maybe he can win, maybe he can't. I don't know, it's a crapshoot. I mean, they've there's been fights where Thor's won, there's been fights where the Incredible Hulk's won. It really just comes down to which character you like the most. But at the end of the day, with this battle between the two, again, this is also taking place at the same time that everything's going on with like the serpent and with with captain america and so on now, this is kind of a big moment here in the fear itself and the reason why is because when the serpent finally arrives when he basically you know picks up on the scene you have like the avengers you know spider-man spider-woman all that kind of stuff luke cage and so on who, who try to combat him and they all get dealt with quick fast and in a hurry i mean they're 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 taken out right off the bat they're not killed they're all just basically knocked out right off the bat and in turn captain america throws his shield to the serpent and the serpent breaks it in half now this is a very very big thing Thing. because the only time we've ever really seen this happen is one if it's a person with reality warping powers or two thanos with the infinity gauntlet we've never seen a person by sheer strength alone shatter the shield of captain america that's never happened before and that's a pretty big deal the problem with this is that in reality the event of captain america's shield being shattered the way it was during infinity gauntlet really kind of overshadows this because the event was so significant but essentially what's going on here is the serpent has single-handedly dismantled the entirety of the superhero community Community. And this is kind of etching in stone that when the Incredible Hulk's knocked out into space by by Hulk, I'm sorry, by Thor, when he's sent flying, you know, into the atmosphere and falls back down again, that it's really a stopgap measure. That's all this has ever really been, a stopgap. These guys are nothing more than just, you know, bubble gum on a leaking wall. Sure, it stops it temporarily, but it's only a matter of time before the pressure builds up and that, that bubble gum gets blown out of the way and that small leak turns into a full-blown flood. So that's exactly what's happening here. They're just kind of in the way at the moment. They're really more of a nuisance than anything else. And that's basically what happens. Happens. Captain America chiming into Hawkeye, basically saying like, we have to stop, we have to stand down. And when the question is asked why, Captain America says, because we're going to lose. Like, look at around you, look around you at everything you've seen. Like, Thor's defeated, the Avengers are getting wrecked to pieces, you know, the Incredible Hulk is a bad guy, Juggernaut's a bad guy, the Serpent shattered my shield with his own bare hands. Like, we're facing off against the force we could not possibly hope to defeat on our own. And so it's, it's not very often you see Captain America do that. 
In fact, I've only ever seen Captain America turn tail and run twice. This is the this is this is one of those times. The second time was Age of Ultron, when Ultron raised the entirety of Earth, and Captain America had just kind of given up. He was like, "There's nothing we can do." Until he realized, until he he, he thought of Doctor Doom's time platform. And so, and you know, with those things in mind, Fear itself is an amazing story because it's basically like pushing the superheroes to the brink. It's presumably the end of all things. Okay, so we are finally getting back into Fear Itself, and we're really covering in this part, like, the one tie-in that everybody cares about. Really, I would say the one part of the story that most people care about, which is the Uncanny X-Men tie-in, Unstoppable Juggernaut. So, it's, it's kind of funny. In these crossover events that Marvel will do, there will just be segments where people are just like, so I don't care about anything else that happens, but I care about, like, that one thing. Because it's cool. Like, like that's, okay, at the end of the day, that's really all comics boil down to, just the cool moments. Like, that's, that's really it. Like, I could cover the entire of like Chris Claremont, uh, Chris Claremont's X-Men run, but there's only like a handful of super cool things that anybody would really care about. So like, it's, it's one of those interesting things in like comic book events and, and all that kind of good stuff. But in any event, switching over to the X-Men, this is all post-Utopia. Now, for those of you guys who are familiar with this, bear with me while I run over this for the guys who are not. Uh, Utopia in the X-Men landscape was basically after the events of Decimation, right? Like the Scarlet Witch took away 98% of the mutant powers population. And then you had an event called Dark Reign. So, so you had like Secret Invasion where the scrolls basically invade the entirety of Earth and the Marvel Universe. Uh, they start replacing superheroes. And so what ended up happening is Deadpool had actually sent information to the superheroes on how to defeat the scrolls. And then Norman Osborn intercepted the information and then used it to win. And so so, uh, yeah, and so that goes into Tony Stark being removed as director of S.H.I.E.L.D. Norman Osborn becomes the new director. He disbands S.H.I.E.L.D., creates Hammer, and then he starts Dark Reign. And so in order to, like, consolidate his power, he basically started trying to get rid of, like, all these different groups. But then you have, like, the X-Men. And at the time, the X-Men were still living in Westchester, I'm pretty sure. And they were recovering from the events of Decimation. But realizing that Norman Osborn would seize the opportunity to basically oust them, what they did is they left the United States proper, that is to say the continental United States, and they took up residence on an island island off the coast of San Francisco. So technically speaking, they were outside of the US government's jurisdiction, but not really. And they were still considered to be part of San Francisco. Now, the way that this happened was actually by way of this chick, uh, Sadie Sinclair. She's basically the one who invited the X-Men to, to stay in Utopia in San Francisco. It was kind of like a friend for the X-Men, but not really. Uh, she appeared in like 15 issues. So she never really had like any meaningful role. But with the X-Men residing in San Francisco and being on good terms with Sadie Sinclair, they basically brief her on what's going on so far. And one of the things is this really pointed out here, and this is pretty important, is this established that Juggernaut is insanely powerful at this point, multiple times over than how he normally is. Because when he has the Crimson Gem of Sidorak, as we know the inscription goes, you know, whosoever touches this gem or possesses this gem shall possess the bands of the, or the power of the Crimson Bands of Sidorak. Henceforth, you who reads these words shall go forward forevermore a human Juggernaut. Paraphrasing. Uh, when it comes to, to that level of power, he's already unstoppable in his own right. It's one of those things where, like, once the Juggernaut starts, starts moving, nobody can really stop him and he's invulnerable to pretty much every form of physical harm the only way to really defeat him is to remove his helmet and then use a psychic attack or something along those lines because even with his helmet gone conventional weapons still wouldn't work he'd be bulletproof they would just bounce off him and so when it comes to something like this what this does is it amplifies his power even that much more and so it's basically the power of the juggernaut with asgardian tech and it's, it's insane what he's capable of not only that he's basically amassed a whole bunch of followers and this is really done more for like a ransom act in the sense that earlier what it what has essentially gone on, or at least what happens here is that when the X-Men launch the initial attack, it's really more of like testing to see what they can and can't do because they don't really know what kind of power the Juggernaut has since it's been amplified. And so when Cyclops and company show up, it's the testing ground. They grab Colossus, they grab uh, Kitty Pride, they go through and they say, okay, look, like we've got to find a way to defeat this guy. And it kind of works for what it is. But initially this, this initial skirmish is disastrous because like all the X-Men are absolutely, I mean, they're, they're decimated. Cyclops is manhandled with no real effort on behalf of Juggernaut, Iceman is taken out in the blink of an eye. And these are some Omega level characters. And so with none of them really being able to stand alone against uh, against Juggernaut, Cyclops essentially calls in and says, okay, look, we have more that we have to do here. So this of course leads to the arrival of Magneto. And it's one of the cool things because you would expect Magneto to be able to slow down Juggernaut or something along those lines. I mean, after all, he is wearing metal. So why not just lift him into the air? But with the enhancements offered by the Serpent, this basically makes Juggernaut and his weapons immune to the powers of Magneto. And so we're Magneto. 
Magneto stands up and, and essentially tries to like, you know, block or I guess catch the hammer of uh, of Juggernaut when he throws it. It just keeps moving towards him. Ultimately, it, it takes Kitty Pride jumping in the way, phasing Magneto so that it, the hammer will pass right through him. Otherwise, it would have killed him. And this basically means that like there's no real way for the X-Men to stop him, that, that Juggernaut truly is unstoppable at this moment in time. And so what they do is they basically say, we need Hope Summers. Now, calling Hope Summers in is no small thing, but you're talking about a character who has the ability to duplicate the powers of anybody around her with no upper limit. And that's what she does. She literally goes through and starts tapping in to the powers. So she's, it's basically a mutant with the powers of a thousand X-Men, or I guess really like a, a, you know, a couple hundred X-Men who in turn is facing off against Juggernaut. And notice this, she does it by the skin of her teeth. What she ends up doing is seizing control of his helmet and then basically melting his helmet and pulling it off. And that's all she can do because the sheer number of powers she's absorbed has been entirely overwhelming. Now, what this does is it allows Emma Frost to basically use Cerebra, uh, Cerebra and then tap into the mind of, of uh, Juggernaut. And notice this, this is one of the funny things. Emma Frost is very cavalier in how she does this, right? She's like, okay, you know, his helmet's gone, whatever, you know, I'll just use my, my telepathy that's, you know, amplified several times over and then just, you know, shut his mind down or something along those lines. It doesn't work, not by a long shot. Her psychic mind is effectively like fractured and, and destroyed. Like it's, it's to the point where she's actually thrown temporarily into a catatonic state because she cannot begin to understand the sheer amount of energy, like psychic energy, rage, fear, anger, the whole nine yards that Juggernaut, uh, Juggernaut is putting off at the moment. It's way more than she knows how to handle and the Juggernaut moves forward. And so at this point, it's a matter of, of kind of running a conflict on two fronts. For Cyclops, again, as leader of the team, one part is getting information, seeing if there's a way to defeat him. And the other part is basically creating a stopgap measure. And so what they end up doing is they end up traveling to meet Ileana Rasputin. Now, Ileana Rasputin is currently locked up in the in a brig inside the, you know, I guess the X brig is what it's called. And the reason for this is because shortly before this story, there was essentially the return of Legion. And the reason why the return of Legion had happened is because it was basically the purgatory, uh, was it Project Purgatory Saga. And it was this idea that after the events of Inferno, which is a way old story that took place in the 1980s when Jean Grey's clone Madeline Pryor had launched an attack on New York by unleashing demons from this, you know, from basically like the netherworld, netherrealm basically, where Ileana Rasputin draws her powers. Uh, what Project Purgatory ended up doing was realizing this was a power source. And so what they started engaging in was was what what amounted to like gene splicing, splicing the genes of mutants with like demons, and then kind of trying to create their own army of sorts. But what happened was Ileana Rasputin had realized what was going on and the power that was available there and essentially brought Legion in from a different dimension and uh, basically brought him back to life. But because Legion is so mentally unstable, because he's so insane, he's a credible threat to everyone. That like his powers to warp reality are extreme. So with this kind of a thing in mind, Ileana Rasputin was basically considered by Cyclops to be a credible threat to the mutant community. So she was thrown in the brig. And so seeking out this information and asking her questions, she basically says, look, I can study this and I can take you to where you need to go, but you're gonna have to let me out of the cell in order to do it. So it's a dangerous game that's being played. Something else is going on here. What we end up doing is kind of sidetracking for a second and picking up with some of these forces who were trying to stop Juggernaut and none of it's working. You know, like you have you have Pixie who's creating like portals trying to get him to different locations and he just walks right through as if they're not there. You've got Rogue who tried to like absorb the power of the Juggernaut way more than she could handle and she ended up shutting down. No one can stop him. And so what ends up happening is they end up taking Ileana Rasputin basically out into the middle of nowhere. She creates a portal and transports everybody but Cyclops to the realm of Sidorak. Now, this is where things really get cool. So Sidorak is one of the elder demons that exists in the Marvel Universe way, way back in the day and was was one of the people who retreated. He's also part of the Octessence. The Octessence was a group of super old entities that existed in on Earth in the, Marvel, in the Marvel Universe. And the idea was they had a contest over which one was the most powerful. And so what they ended up doing is because they couldn't really enter the main Marvel Universe dimension, what they ended up doing was basically creating artifacts, one for each one of these members of the Octessence, and they were placed around Earth. But the idea was that an individual would pick up one of these artifacts and when they did, they would set the, uh, set the Octessence prophecy in motion, the earth would be divided into eighths. Like, an, uh, you know, an, an eighth of the earth's population would be an army for each one of these of these beings. And then in turn, it would just be like a massive war and end time kind of conflict. And whichever army proved to be victorious would show which member of the Octessons was the most powerful. And so during the Korean War, Kane Marco picked up the uh, artifact that belonged to Sidorak, which of course was the Crimson Gem. But with, with Ileana showing up here, she plays it exceedingly smart. What she basically tells Sidorak is, Juggernaut is using power that is somebody else's. 
Now, when it comes to Sederach, he's very much like the Old Testament God of Abraham, right? Like, I am a selfish God. And so do not use anybody's power before me. And that's how Sederach functions. That's what he is, because the role the Juggernaut is playing is to serve explicitly for the avatar of Sederach, the avatar of destruction. And so learning Juggernaut has accepted the power of another entity out there basically means that Sidorak strips Juggernaut of all of his power, basically takes away everything that Sidorak had, give, uh, had given him. Now, it does not really mean that Juggernaut is now insanely weak, hopelessly incapable, you know, incapable of defeating anybody. He's still insanely powerful. But the problem with this is an avatar has to exist. Someone has to be the new Juggernaut. And so where Ileana Rasputin initially steps up, what ends up happening is Colossus takes her place and says, no, I will be the new host for, for the Crimson Gem of Sidorak. Now, this is where things get kind of crazy too. This is something else that happens. Transitioning back to the forces of the X-Men, there's two major things that happen. The first is that Gambit tries to use his powers to detonate objects by literally taking, like touching it to an aircraft carrier that Magneto is sending, like sending directly into Juggernaut. And the idea is to bring the aircraft carrier down onto him and then Gambit will blow it up. It happens and it still doesn't work. I mean, it's it's crazy. Like the level of power that this guy has, he's, he's OP as hell. But with, with Colossus taking on the new power of Juggernaut, it is interesting because in the minds of Kitty Pride, who's basically there, she essentially says like, this will kill Colossus. It'll, it'll kill who he was and transform him into somebody else. And that's kind of what happens here is that when Colossus arrives onto the scene and starts facing off against Unstoppable Juggernaut, one of the things he comments on is that like, he doesn't really want to stop. Like he has a desire to just destroy things. As the avatar of Sidorak, you seek to destroy, you seek to conquer and to eliminate things. And so what this means for Colossus is that he's following that exact charter. And so showing up here and, and facing off against Juggernaut, one of the things he says is that in this instance, in this conflict here, that it's not really like Colossus is winning easily. That for where Colossus is basically unstoppable, that with the power Kane Marco still has, he's still faster, he's still stronger, he's still more durable, like he's he's still he, he's still far more capable than Colossus is. The difference here is that Colossus is unstoppable. That's the difference. That's the one thing. Like Colossus literally just starts tearing him limb from limb because at this point, it just becomes a war of attrition. That Colossus is just like this constant force facing off against Juggernaut and eventually Juggernaut will wear out. Eventually he'll get tired and he won't be able to fight anymore. And that's exactly what takes place. What ends up going on here is the serpent realizes what's 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 happening at this moment. The fact that Juggernaut's basically losing and in response whisks him away, basically snatches him up and sends him directly back over or brings him directly back to where the serpent's at, leaving Colossus in his current form. Now, what this does is this goes forward into the future of Marvel Comics and even directly into like Avengers versus X-Men with Unstoppable Colossus. It was an attempt to, to change his character up, to kind of boost his popularity temporarily, and it worked. Dude, it was, it was a talk of the town. Like, every dude, every single form everywhere was like all the time about like Unstoppable Colossus. Can Unstoppable Colossus beat this guy? Can he beat that guy? Can he do this? Can he do that? It just turned out, it just turned into like battle forms all the time, like battle threats everywhere you went. And so it's kind of interesting because in this moment, what ends up happening is that following the departure of Juggernaut, this really leads to the X-Men just kind of going back to business as usual. But one of the things that happens here is Cyclops pays a visit directly to Sadie and essentially says, look, if things are how they are, then what Sadie had intended to do is that if Juggernaut got close enough to Utopia, that what she wanted to do is kind of take out the entire mutant population and Juggernaut in one fell swoop. Now, it wasn't really from a place of being vindictive. It was a practical approach, but Cyclops learned this was the case. Cyclops learned that ultimately she was going to destroy Utopia. And so what he ends up doing is basically having Hope Summers sit outside and in turn, like take away the ability for Sadie to control her own body and says, look, this is how things are. We keep to ourselves. We keep our own. Thanks for giving us a home. But if you believe you're going to be able to walk over the X-Men, that's not going to happen because we have X-Men back there that can turn your blood to mercury. We have X-Men that can make you lose control of your bodily function. Like we will have them screw up your mind, turn you inside out and make you live the most hor you know, horrid life you could ever imagine. All the while, you don't realize you're just sitting in your living room. So either you can play ball and you can let us be, or we will make you suffer the most horrific experiences you could ever imagine in your entire life. And this is, this is again, continuing the trend of Cyclops falling down the path and becoming somewhat of a darker guy, becoming more extreme and becoming something more akin to a villain. Okay, so getting back into uh, Fear Itself, again, this is just one of those kind of transitionary stories, but for Thor, it's actually pretty interesting. Fear Itself kind of goes into a sort of reshuffling of the landscape for the Thor mytho uh, mythos, somewhat of a, a change up. And again, that even goes into uh, really the new mighty Thor run with, with Tanneris uh, and focuses on like the rebuilding of Asgard, the formation of Asgardia. But at the moment, we're basically picking up with like the fall of Thor, not in the sense that he died, but in the sense that Thor had basically been defeated or at least fought to the 
point of exhaustion, facing off against uh, the combined efforts of Ben Grimm, the Thing, and the Incredible Hulk, both of whom had the power of Thor, essentially. And it was cool, you know, to see that whole thing take place, but it means that even Thor has limits. And so in response to this, the idea is Earth cannot treat Thor. Earth cannot basically give him the medicine he needs in order to survive. And so they have to take him to Asgard in order to uh, get him the kind of treatment that he needs. But again, with Captain America showing up here, this is actually pretty badass because you've got Heimdall who kind of, who tells Odin, look, like there are people showing up here and Captain America alongside like Hawkeye and a handful of others end up bringing in Thor's body. And then Captain America proceeds to read Odin the riot act. Do he, do he, he rips him up and down. He's like, Thor, fix him this moment right now. And I don't want to hear any of the stuff about Midgard has to die. I don't want to hear any of your nonsense, fix him and be done with it. And Odin's just kind of like left stammering, <laughs> right? You know, Odin is not used to being so openly defied, especially by like an earthling, but that's the nature of Captain America. Captain America is not really special. There's really nothing unique about him aside from his shield, but what he lacks in basically anything that makes a superhero worthwhile in terms of powers, he gains in terms of his willingness to basically do whatever it takes to win. But walking into Asgard and then smack talking Odin and telling him, do your damn job is something you don't normally see. And it's cool because Odin just kind of whisks him away right off the bat. Now, re you know, reading between the lines here, we could probably make an argument that there's some respect from Odin to Captain America. The guy's got courage and the guy's got like honor and duty. And these are things that you don't readily find out there. And so it was kind of cool because it's one of these things where Odin could just incinerate him, just wipe out the entirety of the Avengers, but instead just sends him back to Earth. Now, in reality, this is done because the plot has to move forward. I mean, that's really the reason why it happened. The issue with this is that there really is no one left. You know, they're basically in a boat that's again, very akin to Age of Ultron, where it's like, so there's like there's like five of us here and we're basically the last men standing. There, there's, there's really no one else here that can save us. Now, in response to this, with Thor basically receiving the kind of treatment he needs in order to recover, Odin is essentially forced to acquiesce, or at least temporarily, to basically say, you were right and I was wrong. You know, Earth has mighty heroes, and if you really feel the need to fight alongside them, if you really believe this is something that you have to do, then do it. Then take my armor with it. And so basically, Thor gets Odin's Odin's armor. And it's one of these things where Odin says, look, I wore this armor when I fought the serpent and defeated him the first time. This armor will help you. Now, it is formidable in its own right. It does enhance the powers of Thor to a degree, but it's really more of like a protection spell, basically meaning like the, the full uh, bright and, you know, the full might and brunt of the serpent won't affect you in the same way it did if you didn't have this armor in the first place. But notice this, where Thor is ready to sort of be brash and run headlong, there's something to be said about Odin basically saying, look, you believe you're ready, but you're not because you're seeing this as a young man. You don't have the years or the, or the wisdom to understand that what you're basically doing is going headlong into a losing battle. It's the prophecy has been foretold, you're going to die here. Now, something else that I want you guys to take note of here is that this prophecy that Odin is, is referring to is the prophecy of the Midgard Serpent. Now, the Midgard Serpent is totally different from this version of the Serpent. They're, they're distinctly different beings, or at least in the original intention in which they were made. When it comes to the Midgard Serpent, in, in actual Norse mythology, the idea was that in the, in the Battle of Ragnarok, the Midgard Serpent would pierce Thor with a poison tooth and it would kill him. And so when Jack Kirby grabbed those things and rolled it over, the idea was that Thor would basically die during the events of Ragnarok facing off against the Midgard Serpent. What Marvel's really doing here is they're sort of cooking the books, really, if, if we're being honest with ourselves. What Marvel's doing is they're saying, well, the Midgard Serpent was believed to be, you know, believed to have been, you know, your, your, oh God, how do you, how do you pronounce that? Your Mung, your Mungander, I think it is. I, I'm not really sure how to, how to pronounce that. But like the Midgard Serpent, you know, is, is this thing that's there. But in reality, it's actually the hidden brother of Odin. That's kind of what they're saying. But the other half of this is that Thor actually also gets the Odin sword. And the Odin sword is a pretty powerful artifact. I mean, this is one of the few things out there that is really beyond reproach when it comes to insane levels of power. Now, historically speaking in Marvel Comics, the Odin sword has kind of been like a multifaceted object, meaning there have been multiple weapons out there that have been dubbed as the uh, as the, the Odin sword. If you look at like Thor number 300, for example, when Thor fights the Celestials and, and just becomes like ridiculously OP at one point, there's an instance where he's wielding what's called the Oversword, which is kind of like the ultimate weapon out there created by Odin. Uh, and then of course you have like this as the actual Odin sword. In reality, it kind of fluctuates depending on what story you're reading. If you go and read a story during Walt Simonson's run that features Man, uh, Mangog, and I can't remember the, the issues that it was featured in. If you go and you read that, that basically focuses on like Mangog trying to take the Odin sword and use it to destroy Asgard. It's one of these weapons that's exceedingly powerful, but it's not 
immutable, right? Like Celestials have destroyed versions of the Odin sword before, but Thor being given this weapon is being done so because as far as Odin states, it's the only thing that can actually defeat the serpent. That, that it's the only thing that can really annihilate this thing, you know, basically bring it to an end. The other half of this is remember, Tony Stark has been in Asgard proper working on creating Asgardian tech or really melding Asgardian weapons with uh, Stark tech in order to pass those artifacts onto the Avengers. And so what Tony Stark has basically done is he's modified his own suit using Asgardian tech and then in turn created a whole new series of weapons. So for the most part, like they're going into this battle pretty heavy handed. The other half of this is that with Captain America speaking to really what's left of the Avengers here, you basically got like Wolverine, you got Spider-Woman and so on and so forth. It's kind of interesting here because this is really where Captain America shines, right? Again, there's really nothing special about him, but the fact that he's been through so much, the fact that he's such an incredible leader, so on and so forth, is one of the reasons why so many superheroes look up to him. And so when he sort of stands among the ranks of, of really what's left and says, we have to keep fighting, where some people want to give up, in the end, they don't. You kind of have Captain America saying, this is the last stand. If there's no one left here to fight, then this is the end of it. And really like the dire nature of the situation is given way when we end up seeing this instance of Captain America just brandishing a shotgun. This is really designed to be like Captain America among militiamen. Captain America with a shotgun, basically looking like a poor man's leader facing off against, you know, this almost indestructible army of people that are led by the serpent. And so when Captain America basically brandishes this shotgun <laughs> and goes to jump into the conflict, what this essentially means is that he acknowledges the fact they all may, uh, may very well die here. But in the middle of all this, suddenly the Bifrost opens, Iron Man shows up alongside a whole bunch of these other superheroes, or I guess really the, the various Asgardians with the weapons they've brought here. Now that's kind of a cool thing because what Iron Man does is dish them out accordingly and then say, look, these are going to create physical changes in your body. Your body's going to be modified to reflect the various enchantments that have been put on here by Odin. You're going to have a transformation akin to Thor. And it works for what it is because each member of these, uh, of really of, of, of the Avengers wielding these weapons are able to face off against like the heralds of the serpent, but not really the serpent himself. That fight is really geared more to, or really, really reserved more for, uh, for Thor himself. And so it's kind of an interesting thing because by and large, we would expect this to be a battle that Odin would fight. Odin is usually hands off and the story does really center around Asgard and, and Thor. But when it comes to like Odin engaging in battle, that only ever really happens in like the most dire of situations, only if there's no other choice left. In this instance, Thor, the, the prophecy states, Thor is supposed to fight the Midgard Serpent. And so that's what Odin's allowing to happen. He's just kind of going into this prophecy and calling it a day. Now, of course, Thor throwing his hammer doesn't really do anything and we never expected it to. And so where the hammer basically falls back to earth, it's left to Odin, I'm sorry, left to uh, Thor to face off using the Odin sword and basically call it a day. But in this instance, and it's one of the coolest moments in the story, Captain America refuses to quit and he will not back down. And so where he's falling, where the other Avengers are falling left and right, and all really seems to be lost, Captain America rallies the troops yet again and picks up the hammer of Thor. Now, this is the first real time that Captain America's picked up Thor's hammer. He's done it before, and I can't remember the exact issue. I want to say it was it was back during Walt Simonson's run, maybe even before that. But there was an instance where Captain America, in a in a moment of desperation, had picked up Thor's hammer, but it was really just kind of like you know, like kind of swinging, like swinging it towards Thor. It wasn't really enough where he could pick it up with one hand and wield it. But with Captain America wielding the hammer of Thor, the battle begins to shift because seeing Captain America do this really like emboldens and heartens the various Avengers even more because it means now we've legitimately got a fighting chance. Cap picked up Thor's hammer. Holy shit. That's really kind of what that means here. And so it's a, it's a really, really cool moment because turning the tide against the forces of, uh, of, of, of the serpent basically means that like the battle's essentially coming to an end, that it's really beginning to, to wind down here. And so in this massive conflict against the Midgard serpent, some of the Asgardians end up riding into the scene, uh, really being led by Odin to face off directly against, you know, the, the forces of the serpent. But the idea is that, that essentially Thor's going to die here, which he basically does. He manages to stab the serpent in the head using the Odin sword, essentially killing him and then in turn falls to his own death. And so it's kind of a cool thing here because what this does is it disperses the various hammers of the serpent. Everybody returns back to their normal state and then Odin in turn grabs Thor and takes him back to Asgard. Now this is kind of a big moment here because the way that this was done, all indications was that this was going to see the, the death of Thor, that Thor was going to be officially removed from the Marvel landscape. That's the entire perspective that was being put off by Marvel. The issue with this is that while Thor is not the highest selling character, 
that Marvel's ever had. He is certainly one of the most recognizable, especially now in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And so when you're talking about someone like Thor, you can't just kill him off, right? I mean, you can't just get rid of him. Somebody has to take his place. And so in this instance, of course, now, like, well, at least as awesome as it was, we had Jane Foster, which I'm still so pissed that she's not Thor anymore. <laughs> but in this instance, like, Thor would have to return in some form or fashion. And so what this does is that in this kind of rebuilding phase, you know, in this moment when everything's sort of being, uh, the Avengers are kind of rebuilding everything and, and really a lot of the work's being handed over to Damage Control, who in turn are going to start rebuilding everything with their government subsidies and contracts and absolute corruption in the most heinous of ways. What this means is that the Serpent himself has kind of been brought back to Asgard and is going to be monitored by Odin. But at the same time, Thor is essentially like burned at the pyre. It's basically like he's getting, he's receiving an Asgardian funeral. And so the question a lot of people had is what comes next? Like what comes after this with Thor being removed? Now, this is something that's kind of interesting here. So following this in from 2010 going to 2011 and 2012, Marvel launched Marvel Now. And what Marvel Now was designed to do was kind of reshuffle things. Now this kicks off something called Shattered Heroes. And Shattered Heroes was basically the aftermath of fear itself and the fact that like the heroes had basically been forced to face some of their biggest fears. And with the Marvel, you know, as the Marvel tagline always goes, and it changed the Marvel universe forever. Not really, but that was that that was the kind of tagline that was basically being used. But but in this whole thing, what this did is it set the stage for Matt Fraction to finish his run, which brings in Tanneris, I'm pretty sure is how you pronounce his name, which is basically Ulik the Troll pretending to be Thor or pretending to be like a like a Thor reborn character. And then Loki essentially rescuing the real Thor by kind of splitting Donald Blake and Thor in half again. So it was it was sort of like a like a, a ham fisted thing is really what it was. It was it was kind of kind of like this idea. Well, Thor and, and, and De Donald Blake are still one person. All right, get rid of him. Like, get rid of that thing. It's old hat. Marvel's been doing it like we've been doing it since the 1960s. Just split them and be done with it. And that's basically what it was. And that leads directly into Jason Aaron's Go uh, Gore the God Butcher story arc. So you got like six issues and then Gore. That, that's that's really what happens here. It just kind of wraps up the tail bit of Thor. He eventually returns and that's that's really the end of that. But going into Shattered Heroes, things are actually kind of cool to a degree. It, it, it kind of depends on what you're reading about. If you're reading like Mighty Avengers, things actually get pretty badass. If you're reading just like your standard Avengers, well, you know, that basically goes into Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers run. And then you go into like, you know, the, the you know, the whole like basically setting the stage for like Avengers versus X-Men and all that kind of good stuff. Uncanny X-Force, I think, continues on for a little while. There's a few things that happen here and there. Of course, this also leads directly, you know, with this whole situation between uh, Banner and the Hulk, the Hulk becoming a sort of herald of the serpent. Uh, this led into the Incredible Hulk himself separating Bruce Banner, which we covered in Jason Aaron's run. So again, like a lot of the things that we've covered recently within the last year or so from like Captain America and Iron Man and the Incredible Hulk and the Avengers and so on and so forth, all that really stems out of fear itself. All that really comes out of all this stuff. So again, it's a pretty cool story and, and it's pretty interesting in terms of the purpose it serves. But again, it just kind of sets the stage for things to come after this. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoy this video, make sure you drop a like and yeah, I will catch you all later. Peace.